Well, hello, friends. Welcome back to This Redeemed Life. This is Marion Jordan Ellis. And oh gosh, I just love teaching God's word. You know why? Because every time I open the Bible and I sit before the Lord and I read the scripture, the Holy Spirit shows me something new. And, you know, today was really convicting for me. And so I hope it is for you in a good way. Uh, We are going to be talking about uh, Mark chapter six and really one of the most famous stories in the Bible. It's where Jesus feeds the 5,000. And it's so famous that it's in every single gospel account, meaning what occurred in this miracle was so profound that when every gospel writer sat down to tell about Jesus, to tell about what they uh, were eyewitnesses to, what impacted them, what convinced them that Jesus Christ is God, he is the Lord God Almighty, that this story was one of those stories that they just had to tell. Uh, Before we dive into it, um, I think this story tells us a lot about living in the kingdom. Now, if you're new with me, new to the podcast, um, or even new to God's word, let me define what the kingdom is. The kingdom of God is that God is the king and he has no rival. And that when Jesus came, he came to usher in the kingdom of God. And the reason is, is the world had been under the realm and the kingdom of darkness. And so Jesus, the light of the world steps into the darkness to redeem us and to bring in the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is wherever God reigns and God rules. And so when you put your hope and faith in Jesus, you become a child of God. We become citizens of this kingdom. And what that means is, is the agenda of our life is a different agenda than the different than of this world. We're going to live by a different power, but Also, we're going to live for a different purpose. Um, The Bible uses a lot of metaphors to talk about who we are. We're God's children. We're disciples, meaning we're followers of Jesus. But right now, I want us to think about this term ambassador. Uh, If you think about uh, United States, for example, if we have an ambassador to another country, that person represents the United States. As citizens of God's kingdom, The word of God says we are his ambassadors. We serve him. Our lives are meant to represent him. We are here for his will and his purpose and his glory. I say all that is because, you know, when I first came to Christ, I was coming from living for myself, living for my own agenda, living for what made me happy. And then I was wrecked by Jesus in a great way. The gospel made sense to me. I was rescued from my sin and from living for myself. And then my my priorities started shifting. And it wasn't something someone taught me, but the spirit inside of me would say things like, my life is not my own anymore. I knew that I belonged to King Jesus and that he got to call the shots. And as I looked in the gospels, I see that that is the response of a disciple. Like we see that Jesus is preaching and he tells Peter or John or whoever, come follow me. And then they leave everything to follow him. And so what I mean by that is that when you're living for the kingdom, you're living for the purpose of the king. Now, let me just make this one thing clear. I believe that every single follower of Jesus, every single child of God, every single person who is part of the kingdom of God, I believe you are called into ministry. Now, do I think all ministry looks the same? Do I believe everyone's supposed to work for a church or do what I do? Absolutely not. If you are a nurse, you are a nurse for the kingdom of God. If you are a school teacher, you're a school teacher for the kingdom of God. If you are in real estate, I have many friends in real estate, you are in real estate for the kingdom of God. But our purpose is to advance the kingdom. Our The person we work for is King Jesus. Now, why do I tell you that? I tell you that because when we look at um, Mark chapter 6, P.S., we are walking through the gospel of Mark on this podcast. If you're new, welcome. Uh, in Mark chapter 6, we see the disciples who have um, abandoned their lives to follow Jesus and they have been brought into ministry with Jesus. And in the context of Luke, uh, Mark 6 is Jesus has sent them out 
to preach the kingdom. He sent them out to proclaim the good news that the king is here to heal the sick, to cast out demons, to be his hands and feet. Instead of Jesus being the only one who's doing the ministry, he has now entrusted the ministry to his disciples and he has sent them out. Now, what is so cool about this is the only measure of success is obedience. That's all. That's all. He doesn't ask them to give a certain number of demons that were cast out, a certain number of people that were healed, a certain number of people. He just wants their obedience. And as they go in his power, in his name, using his authority, they do his will. And I think that's such a picture for us um, that that's all God wants of us as we are going about our lives. He wants us in a posture of surrender. He wants us full of his spirit, that we are representing him and we are going and doing what he has us to do. So the other thing we see from Mark, five, uh, Mark chapter six is that as the disciples go, they come back and they're excited. They are thrilled. They have this, um, this energy in life, but they're also at the same time exhausted. And I think that's such a picture of the kingdom life that you can be absolutely full and so full because of what you are doing in the power of God and the power of the spirit, but you can also be physically spent emotionally drained. You can be exhausted. You know, I, I go through seasons in ministry where I'm sometimes I'm full on days of teaching days of just, you know, people. And while the fullness of the spirit is something you can barely explain to somebody how it's absolutely supernatural, how God empowers you and fills you to do his will. But on the flip side, there is an exhaustion that is like, whoa, that's tired. And so that I want to set that up because that's the context that we see the disciples as we start to look at this miracle. They are physically tired. They are emotionally spent. And someone give me a witness on this. The, the brothers are hungry. And uh, I know some low blood sugar in my situation and they want, they want some crackers. They want a meal. They just want, they want some chips and salsa. They want some food and I can feel for them. And so in the, in the, the story we're about to re read, it said, um, it casually is like, they didn't even have time to eat. They, I mean, they were so busy that they didn't even have time to eat. And I, you know, I'm like waving the flag over here, like, let's go get some, you know, let's find a fast food joint. Uh, so let's look at um, Mark chapter six. I'm going to begin at verse 30 because it um, just kind of where we are in the story. And it says the apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. So at the beginning of this chapter, Jesus has sent them out uh to do ministry, to proclaim the kingdom, to heal people, to cast out demons. And they go as his ambassadors. So verse 30 tells them, tells us now they've returned to him and they've told him all they've done. So verse 31, Jesus said, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while because he understands they're depleted. He understands they poured out that they need to be restored. Rest is from God. It's good. So he's told them, let's go away by ourselves and you're going to just take some time off. Uh, for many were coming and going and they had no leisure to even eat. So that's where we get this picture of there are so many people, there are so many demands, there are so much going on, so much ministry demand that they don't even have time to rest and they don't have the time to eat. So verse 32 says, and they went away in the boat to a desolate place by themselves. Now, many saw them going and recognized them, and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. So here's the context of this story. The disciples and Jesus have been doing ministry on one side of the Sea of Galilee. The disciples come back. They tell Jesus everything that's happened. He's like, okay, y'all need some rest. Let's go on to the other side of, uh, of the lake and we'll have some time out there. Well, the crowd see them get into the boat and watch them sail away. And it's about a four mile journey from one side of the lake to the other where they're going. Well, the crowds 
see the direction they're heading. So they start running there on foot. So imagine there's already one crowd. And as this crowd begins to run across to the other side of the lake, around the lake, they start telling people, Jesus is going to this certain destination. Jesus is going to Bethsaida. And so all of the people in mass begin to follow the parade of people who are desperate to get to Jesus. So by the time Jesus and the disciples land on the other side in the boat, there's a mob waiting for them. And like the disciples who write the story say, the crowd is massive. We know later it's 5,000 men. So P.S., when they record 5,000 men, they have not recorded the women and they have not recorded the children. So 5,000 men, at least one woman, that's 10,000. Let's add multiple children. We're looking at a crowd here of probably 20,000 people. Now that is the size of the city. The small town I grew up in was 20,000. So I'm imagining the entire city I grew up in standing somewhere on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, waiting as this little bitty boat pulls up and Jesus and the disciples get off. And I can hear, if it's me, I can hear the groans of the disciples like, you have got to be kidding me. We just left these people and now there's more of them. And here's the the very convicting part. That's not how Jesus responds. The really convicting part for me is I'm like, I want to hide in the boat and I want to get a, uh, a snack bag and I want to take a nap. And Jesus comes out of the boat. He steps on the shore and Mark tells us he had compassion on them. Okay. Let's all be convicted together. Can we just do that? Compassion in the Greek means he's moved from the inside. Like it's not like fake compassion. He literally feels emotional sorrow for them. He has empathy for them. And why? He sees them as sheep without a shepherd. And that's that phrase, sheep without a shepherd, is used often throughout the Bible. And it's a metaphor to say that these people are like helpless sheep. And if you don't know much about sheep, I only do because I've studied the Bible a lot. Sheep are not a great thing to be compared to. They're very dumb. (laughs) And Jesus is not calling us stupid, but sheep require the care of a shepherd. Sheep need a shepherd to help them find water, to help them find food, to protect them from the wolves that want to come kill them. If If a sheep were to actually get turned over like in a ditch, it cannot get up by itself. It needs the shepherd to come even turn it back the right way. Sheep will run off a cliff in mass unless the shepherd tells them not to. So when Jesus says they're like sheep without shepherd, he like sincerely feel sorry for these people because they can't feed themselves. They can't find water. They can't, they are thirsty, spiritually thirsty. They're spiritually hungry. They're spiritually malnourished. They're spiritually in need. And he knows that he alone is the good shepherd. So despite like how I in the natural, I'm like, I'm tired. I want to take a nap. Jesus is like, he's God. And he's, he's the, he's so full of love and compassion that he sees the need and he, he meets the need. And so he begins to preach to them. Now um, don't think of preaching in the sense of you know, condemning them. He sits down and begins to teach them about the kingdom of God. He begins to instruct them because what their souls need more than anything else is to know truth. And he begins to give them the truth of the kingdom, uh, which I think is so beautiful. Um, And I love that Jesus doesn't see an interruption to his plan. He sees people. And so often, uh, you know, when following the Lord. And I have an agenda. I have my plan. I have my day marked out and something happens that I wasn't expecting. I see an interruption when in reality, I should should be seeing a divine intervention where God is saying, no, I've got this before you. And this is what I have for you. Um, So Jesus doesn't see these people as an obstacle in his way. He sees them as an opportunity for grace. And um, I'm asking God personally to make me more that way, that interruptions are opportunities. Interruptions are opportunities for him to show up. So 
we got to remember the disciples are exhausted. They have been on this ministry tour. They are hungry. They are tired. Jesus has promised them a little vacay. Um, So verse 35 says, and when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, this is a desolate place and the hour is now late. Send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages to buy themselves something to eat. So here's what I imagine is happening. Jesus is teaching and teaching and teaching and teaching. And it says the hour grew late, meaning uh, it's time. A great teaching, Jesus. Great things. All that mustard seed, all of that stuff you've been sharing. Wonderful content. We are tired. And so uh, they get a representative from the 12. Let's probably guess it's Peter. You know, I'm just going to guess. And Peter has to walk up or whoever it is. We don't know. But one of the disciples went up and said, you know, we're really concerned about all the people here, like the mob here, that they're probably hungry. The blood sugar is getting low. We probably should send them to find something to eat. You know, they were more like, we're hungry. Can we please make the people go home? But that's not what they say. They 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 act like they're concerned for the people. I totally get this. Last night I went to friend, a dinner with some friends for a friend's birthday, and we arrived at six. Um, I quickly ordered an appetizer because I had decided to work out right before going to eat because I was like, I know I'm going to feast. So I went on the bike and I did a quick workout. So by the time I get to dinner, I'm famished. I'm starving. I like I want some food. Two hours later people hear me, we still did not have our meal. And so I'm like, I'm not safe to represent Jesus well right now. Like I'm not going to be a good ambassador. So I looked at my sweet friend who's always very kind. I like, you need to talk to the manager because I don't want to be the one talking to the manager because I don't want to embarrass Jesus. So you go talk to the manager. And so she went and kindly said, can we please get our food? We're starving here. And so I understand this moment with the disciples because they're all hungry. They are all tired and maybe true. They're looking at this crowd going, you know what? It's like eight o'clock at night. We've been here all day. They haven't had a meal yet. And they're like, we probably need to dismiss the crowd. And so they pick one of the 12 to go tell Jesus. And so Jesus says, you feed them. I'd be like, oh, that was not the plan, Jesus. You know, let's just send them to Whataburger, to McDonald's, to Sonic. Let's send them somewhere. And Jesus looks at the disciples and like, if you're really concerned about these people, you feed them. And so the disciples are like, uh, how are we going to do that? I mean, these are great questions, right? And remember, they are at the end of themselves. They are tired. They are hungry. And let's look at verse 37. But he answered them, you give them something to eat. And they said to him, uh, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it them, to them to eat? So they're like, that's all the money can, we can imagine. If we went and bought all that bread, is that how we would be them? And he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they found out, they said five loaves and two fish. Now they have 20,000 people. We know minimum 5,000 men plus wives and children. You know, so we're, we're going to just do a ballpark number here of 20,000. Um, this miracle is recorded in all four gospels. The only other miracle recorded in all four gospels is the resurrection. So this is so powerful. What happens is that every disciple is like, and then this happened and this happened. And they told the story over and over again, and they had to write it down because it was the miracle that was so compelling and so convincing. So the disciples come back to Jesus and they record the facts or what um, seemed possible in the natural realm. They start by saying, if we had all the money we could imagine, we still couldn't buy enough bread for these people. And Jesus said, well, what do you have? Tell me what you do have. Don't tell me what you need to have. Tell me what you do have. And he, they said, we found five loaves of bread and two small fish. And Jesus like, give me what you have. And to me in ministry and in the kingdom life, that's such a picture. God is not asking us for what we do not have. He's asking us, what do you have? 
Like when Moses is like, I can't go to Egypt. What am I going to do? He's like, what's in your hand? He's like, I got a staff. He's like, I'm going to use that. And so he's looking at us and go, I don't need what you don't have. I need what you do have. And so they bring this small offering to the one who can work miracles with nothing. And uh, let's look at the rest of it. Then he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the grass. So they sat down in groups by hundreds and by fifties and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. And they divided the two fish among them and they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up 12 baskets full of broken fish and bread. And those who ate the loaves were 5,000 men. So there's a miracle on multiple proportions here. The fact that you can get 20,000 people to sit down in small groups without a bullhorn or a microphone, and that's like herding cats. So as a former teacher, let me just say, there's the first miracle. Number two, Jesus takes the little meal and he blesses it. He looks at the father, he blesses this meal. Okay. And then he breaks it and he hands a small portion to the disciples. And here's what we need to understand. The miracle then happened in the hands of the disciples. As they left Jesus and they walked to the crowd, they began to hand it out and hand it out and hand it out. And it still, there was enough and there was enough and there was enough and there was enough and there was enough. And they keep handing it and they keep handing it and they keep handing it. And it multiplied and it multiplied and it multiplied and it multiplied. But the miracle happened in the hands of the disciples. Jesus commanded the miracle. Jesus blessed the miracle, but the disciples held the miracle. Y'all, that is the kingdom life. That is the kingdom life. It's his power. It's his name. But we are the hands and the feet. That's the part we play. And when we show up, he shows out. And I love that this Jesus usually performs most in us when we're at the end of ourselves. The disciples had nothing to give. They were tired. They were exhausted. They could bring nothing to the table. They didn't even have anything in the natural realm to bring. And then at that point of complete inability, that's where he uses them the most. They take from his hands and they offer it to others. And this is the miracle of multiplication. This is what God does. We see the same miracle similarly in John chapter two, when Jesus changes the water into wine. Jesus is the one who you know, blesses the water and it changes. He blesses the water, but he hands it to the servant. And as the servant is obeying and taking it, it is transformed. And I what, what I want us to see here is that miracles happen when by faith we obey. When by faith we obey. The disciples had to have faith that God was going to do this. And then they had to take the step walk to the crowd with the small loaf in their hands and start handing it out. Friends, we are all in ministry. We're all disciples of Jesus. We're all part of the kingdom. So when we show up, we surrender and we allow Jesus to use us. And we just say, I'm your hands. I'm your feet. I'm your mouth. And then we do what he says to do. We obey. That's where we see the miracles. That's where we see God show up. That's where we see lives transformed. That's where we see God do what is literally impossible. You know, my ministry life verse is Zechariah 4, 6. It says, it is not by might. It is not by power. It is not, it's by my spirit, says the Lord. And, you know, I'm coming into this new stage of life. I am, I'm not the girl I was in my early thirties. When I first started this, I have walked with Jesus now over 20 years. I am more in love with Jesus than ever, but I am in this stage where God, I want to see you do miracles on this earth. And what I hear him saying is be available. Don't see people as obstacles, be surrendered to me in all things. And let me put in your hands and by my name, do the work in my name and by my spirit, do the work. And I just want to call all of us um, to kingdom living. We are as ambassadors. People are desperate. Jesus saw sheep without a shepherd and they are still here. This world is filled with sheep who need to know the shepherd. Jesus is the good shepherd and we are entrusted 
We are entrusted to be carriers of his glory, to be proclaimers of his truth, to be people who get to tell the gospel, the good news that, hey, you are dead, but Jesus can make you alive, that forgiveness and hope is impossible. And when we obey, when we surrender, when we walk out in the power of the spirit, we get to see the water turn to wine. We get to see him do the miracle of multiplication, and we get to stand in awe of what he's done. Friends, I pray that you will go out this week in the power of the spirit, obey uh, the still small voice of God as he is with you and um, minister to those he puts in your path. God bless you.